What are you doing in Miami? Well, what's everybody doing in Miami? Uh, well, other people Art are Basel. living here. Yeah, Art right? Basel. Yeah, right. that's, that's why you, I'm have here. You seen, have you bought any art yet? No, I said no one will take my gold bars for the <laughs> art. Come on, lugging them around. You're getting heavy. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm here. I want to buy some NFTs. Really? Of course not. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you yeah, really no, not? I, I, I have some Bitcoin art. I brought it with me. Yeah? Yeah, it's right, it's right here. In fact, I put it, it's all over the table. You can't. <laughs> it's just like real art, except it, you can't see it, you can't touch it. It has no actual value, no real utility. Do you really, I'll, listen, I'll sell it to you. I have, you I have a serious question. Do you own any Bitcoin for real? No, well, I own some, I just can't get at it. Why? Well, because I don't have my password. <laughs> <laughs> you said you realize but, that sounds ridiculous. But I don't know. Yes, but I don't even have a full Bitcoin there. It's only like a third of a Bitcoin. Okay, so it's a good thing you didn't send so me that hundred dollars. So it's to twenty thousand. So it's twenty thousand dollars for the Bitcoin. Yeah, but you know that's the wallet you were supposed to send me a hundred dollars worth of Bitcoin to. You never did, which yeah. is just as well because you know it's lost. Okay, <laughs> what what would it take to get you to buy some Bitcoin? Well, why would I buy Bitcoin though? No, no, I, you didn't answer the question. What would it take to get you to buy some Bitcoin? Well, I, I guess how, you, how far would gold? Well, I have guess to if fall? you gave me some money under the with the condition that I had to use it to buy Bitcoin, I guess I'd have to buy Bitcoin because I'm an honorable <laughs> person. So if it was your money, I guess I would buy it. But I don't. When, I don't want to buy it with my own money. If and when Bitcoin passes gold's market cap, will you buy some? Well, a I don't think it's ever gonna pass gold's market cap, but you know that's a good starting point for a conversation because everybody always wants to look at the market cap of gold. And just assume that Bitcoin is going to take that market cap. But, you know, a good chunk of that market cap, probably half of it, has to do with gold's use in jewelry. No, right? wrong, wrong. You, yes, wrong. it is. Seven percent. No, it's not. You want to bet? Oh, look seven, you want to bet? What percent, what percent of gold's market cap is held by investors? My guess, say? my guess is a, a pretty big percentage. No, it's about 20 percent. You know, so Bitcoin already almost has that market cap, right? Because it can't replace gold in industry. It can't replace gold in jewelry. Gold, gold market cap? Is about uh, what, 13 trillion? Okay, so according to this, hold on. According to this, distribution of gold demand worldwide by sector in 2020. This is- uh, That's demand. I'm talking Statista. about the actual- Hold on. It says jewelry exists. is 36%. Investment is 46. Central of banks demand. is eight. And technology is 8%. Yeah, but I, I I'm talking about, tech. but the market cap includes all the gold that's above ground. Okay. Right. That includes, you know, the gold in everybody's jewelry. Okay. There's a lot of gold that's, in, that's held in jewelry. That's a, a good chunk of the market cap. So Bitcoin can't take that market cap. You, 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 you can't make any jewelry out of Bitcoin. I mean, I think that Bitcoin's market cap is already close to gold's when it comes to individual private ownership for investment purposes. I'm not counting central banks. So what, central how, much banks, you, how much do you think is investment demand for gold? 50%? I, 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 no, I think about 20% of the, the above ground gold. That's okay. part of the market. So that'd be like cap. 2 trillion. Yeah, two, two, yeah two, two and a half trillion. And that's kind of close to the market cap for Bitcoin already. Well, that would be and Bitcoin you, would have to double to get there. No, it's without, it's, no less yeah. than. But if you take Bitcoin's all. Out, the, Bitcoin's at $1 trillion. All right, all right. But if you take all the cryptos, <laughs> yeah. Ether and all the rest of the crap. But those aren't trying to compete. Well, well sure they are. With gold? No, with Bitcoin. They, no, they, no, they're they, not. They're trying to do other things. No, they're not. They're, yeah, they're, they're competing with Bitcoin for people who want to gamble on crypto tokens. Do you think it's, that most people are buying Bitcoin because they're trying to gamble? Of course, they're buying Bitcoin because they think it's going to 100,000 or they think it's going to a million. That's why they're buying it. But how much of your portfolio is in stocks? Like 50%, 80%? Well, my portfolio, well, my stock portfolio is all stocks. Well, so no, no, no about, but like your financial portfolio, how, what percentage is like just all equities in general? Well, 70%? That's, well, I mean, if you exclude real estate that I own yeah, yeah, yeah. and private businesses, yep. if you look at like how my, you know. Like li I, liquid portfolio. Yeah, I'm mostly in stocks. Okay. The vast majority of what I have and so when is you in buy common it, stocks. When you buy it, uh, equity, you're buying it because you think that it's going to go up in value against the dollar. No, mostly I'm buying companies that I think are undervalued. They pay good dividends to me. Uh, I want to get out of paper. I don't want to own uh, bonds because I think bonds are going to lose value. You sold them all. Well, I didn't really sell my bonds because I never really owned any. I mean, I had I had some uh, foreign bonds, uh, but I'm almost all in non-U.S. equities. And right. a lot of those equities are mining companies. And those are the that part of my portfolio has not been performing well. Um, gold stocks have really gotten hit. 
All right, I want to give I want to give you some softballs. I'm gonna let you yeah. do what you do best. Ready? <laughs> First softball. They say inflation is six point two percent. They've been saying that it's transitory. We now have the retirement of the word transitory. Like literally, they should have held an award ceremony, put it in the Hall of Fame. It's retired. Yeah. What do you think about them not wanting to use the word transitory anymore? Does that mean that it's permanent, or does that mean that they just don't want to talk about it anymore? Well, I think they're tired of trying to obfuscate as to what they meant. I mean, I think initially. When they said transitory, they meant transitory. Mm -hmm. But then when it turned out not to be transitory, they had to kind of redefine the word and kind of, you know, to try to save face. Uh, but at this point, they've, they've twisted it into such a pretzel that I think they just want to walk away from it because they really looked ridiculous in the face of overwhelming evidence that inflation was not transitory uh, to try to claim that it was. But... I still think the methodology that we're using today to calculate inflation is deeply flawed. And when they contrast what's happening today to the 1970s, they never talk about the fact that the CPI that exists today is nothing like the one that existed back in the 1970s. And this is cost of living versus cost of uh, goods. Yes. I mean, and basically, now it's the cost of surviving. <laughs> I mean, by, by today's methodology, look, it doesn't matter if you're eating filet mignon or dog food. As yeah. long as you're eating, uh, then you got nothing to complain about. right? They, they don't really look at the quality, even though they claim to uh, when they have substitution or hedonics. But that's the, a savage comment. It, the whole the thing is rigged now. But if 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 we were measuring prices today and we just used the same CPI that they used back then, I think the inflation in 2021 was as bad, if not worse, than any single year of the 1970s. Okay. And so I that, think, what percentage would that be? I don't know, probably 13, 14, 15 okay. percent. So I mean, some, that's probably some 15, but over 10. Yeah. I mean, if you look at import export prices. Those numbers are more real, and that's about what you see because okay. there they're actually taking a look at how much are the goods that we're importing costing, what are the goods that we're exporting. It's just apples to apples, and you can actually see the prices. Although anecdotally, most of the price increases that people you know point out to me, I get a lot of emails and people show me, hey, this is what I just bought, and here are the exact same thing I bought last year or six months yeah. ago, and you look at the price increases, uh, they're much bigger than 6%. Okay. Se second thing is that we now have Jerome Powell as the Fed Reserve Chairman going to be renominated and continue. Good decision, bad decision, or would you have done something different if you were President Schiff? Well, I, there probably would be no Fed if I was. The <laughs> <laughs> I would have already gotten rid of it. But um, look, I, I predicted on my podcast that Biden would take the coward's way out and renominate a Powell. I mean, why is it the coward's way out? Well, you know, you don't want to go out on the limb and put somebody else in there who's your person, because then if anything goes wrong, it's your fault, right? It's if a safe you just choice. you it's just leave choice, the yeah. guy there that's there because hey, everybody wants him there, um, and then if every something goes wrong, hey, it's not my fault. Look, he's not my guy. Trump appointed him, and you know the Republicans wanted me to keep him, and uh, so it's it's easier for him than going out on a limb because if. If the economy does well or Powell does a good job, then he gets credit for reappointing him. Uh, but to go out in left field and, and, and go for a Brainerd or somebody else and then something goes wrong, you know, what, why? I mean, Trump kind of had to get rid of Yellen because he spent his whole campaign bashing Yellen, uh, basically for doing exactly what he then bashed Powell for not doing until Powell got his mind right and started doing exactly what Trump criticized Yellen for doing. Um, but look, he's done a lousy job. I mean, if you want to look at the Fed's, uh, you know, uh, mandate of price stability, we clearly don't have it. Um, but, you know, th I, I think really what the Fed's job is, as far as Biden is concerned, is helping me get reelected and kicking the can down the road until the next election. Do you think anyone would do something different? Like, if What would they you have done if you were in that seat? Well, you know, what I would do, I, you know, I would let the markets know that the Fed is no longer going to be setting interest rates, that the market was going to do that. And we were going to start liquidating our holdings of U.S. Treasuries. <laughs> because <they should. laughs> And of course, in so doing, there would be massive losses uh, that and, and, you know, the bill goes to the U.S. taxpayer. You know, as the Fed unwinds its balance sheet, any losses are IOUs to the U.S. taxpayer because the U.S. government has to make the Fed whole um, for that. 
Um, I, but it also, you know, I would let the government know that the Fed is no longer in the business of monetizing government debt. And that if you want your bill back better, you better figure out how you're going to pay for it. How, how Okay, this is what I want to talk about as well is uh, they say it's cost zero dollars. Is that bullshit? Of course it's bullshit. I mean, they, right. they always say that because their assumptions are ludicrous. Like I what? Mean, Break it down for me. Well, Professor the revenue Schiff. assumptions, they're not going to get the revenue. A lot of the revenue is supposedly going to come from extra IRS agents, you know, getting the rich to pay their fair share. Well, you know, they're not going to get much more money out of the rich. Uh, there's not that many rich people other than you crypto guys. Um, but and you don't pay taxes anyway because you never so, sell. You're right? so salty. You just, you're so <laughs> salty. You guys never sell, so they're not getting any. You'd tax be one money. of the richest people in the world if you had bought Bitcoin. When you first heard about it. Keep going. But um, but they're not going to get the revenue. I okay. mean, they're obviously mainly going to target the middle class. That's where the extra IRS enforcement is going. But you know, it's hard to get blood from a stone. So I don't think they're going to get a lot of revenue. Meanwhile. All these new programs are going to cost so much more than they think. I mean, first of all, they act as if the programs are going to go away in, you know, five years. Because they don't want to count the spending in the out years. Although we all know that these programs never go away. Once they're there, they're there forever. I mean, we're still dealing with temporary programs from the Second World War. You know, the war ended. Well, why are these temporary programs still in effect, right? They, they never go away. There's an old saying, I think it was Milton Friedman, there's nothing as permanent as a temporary government program. So to pretend that these programs are going to sunset is nonsense. But also, they have grossly underestimated the cost because the government doesn't understand moral ha hazard. They don't understand what happens. So part of the Build Back Better is everybody gets free um, uh, preschool. Well, the cost of preschool is going to go way up once the government makes it free, because now the demand for preschool goes way up. And now the preschool start jacking up their tuition because they like know the, the defense industry, the defense industry is, oh, you're going to pay us all this money. Yeah. We're just going to keep increasing the cost of it to you because we yeah. know you got a ton of money. It's just like, look what government did to college tuition before the government started subsidizing college tuition and guaranteeing loans. College tuition was cheap. Government gets involved and it costs a fortune. So it's gonna, it's they're gonna end up spending a lot more on preschool than they think. But I think the biggest one is gonna be if it stays in there, because the Senate might get rid of it. But that is the paid family um, medical leave, uh, because everyone's gonna take that. They just assume that well, only the people that actually have a medical emergency are going to ask for their four week paid vacation. No, I mean, didn't they learn their lesson from the PPP or the extended unemployment benefits? If you tell an American that they can have a four week paid vacation at 90% of salary every single year, and all they have to do is claim they have to take care of a sick friend or family member, you don't think they're going to say that? My that's brother what they just have to got do? sick. Damn. Yeah. <laughs> they're going to take every I mean, single one like, of them will take it. You tell me everybody that had a emotional support animal on an airplane actually needed that animal for <laughs> Are you, Peter, you're ruthless. You're going after the animals? <laughs> no, it's the people. Hey, <laughs> hey look. <laughs> no, but people look. People try to qualify for these programs. Everyone's going to want to take a month off every summer. So, oh my God, my, my my uncle needs my help. My kid needs my help. I'm not feeling well. I'm depressed. He just happens to live in Italy. I got to go to the summer. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's right. going to suddenly have a sick relative in the summer. Yeah. Right? yeah. <laughs> All right. So when this happens, uh, what is the impact? The programs cost more than they think. And then they can't get as much revenue as they think. So what is the impact, in your opinion, uh, if this gets passed and implemented? Well, it's just more inflation, you know, because the Fed has to print more money. That's why the Fed is talking about printing less money. That's tapering. But they're going to have to print more money uh, to fund these uh, deficits. Otherwise, interest rates go way up. And what happens if interest rates go way up? Well, the deficits actually get bigger because now the government has to spend even more interest. I mean, even more to pay the interest on the debt that it already has, not to mention the new debt that's being incurred, but also when interest rates go up, it hurts the bubble economy because now everybody has to pay higher interest. So you can't spend more money on other things because your your interest rates went up, your adjustable rate mortgage went up, uh, you know your credit card interest rates went up. Uh, people can buy less stuff on credit because car loans are more expensive. So this whole bubble economy starts to unravel 
and we go towards recession or into recession. And when that happens, government tax receipts fall, more spending on unemployment. So the deficits get even bigger. So the Fed has no choice if it's going to keep everything going. Uh, but to expand the QE program, print even more money, create even more inflation. And, and so the price increases that we're experiencing now, you know, are just a small taste of what's will to come. See, will we see 10% inflation in the official CPI number in the United States in the next three years, you think? I think we will, unless they rig the numbers again. I mean, <laughs> I wouldn't put it past them. But assuming they leave the CPI the way it is, Probably. We might see 10% next year. Is inflation but, going to get worse in the coming year? Well, it has to get worse. And, and, and in fact, and again, when you're talking about price increases, you're measuring the consequence of inflation. The inflation is the expansion of the money supply. And we know money supply is going to keep expanding. They're about to raise the debt ceiling, right? So we can keep uh, going deeper into debt. You know, I always laugh whenever they talk about it. Janet Yellen, you know, when she testified the other day. She said six times the government's going to be bankrupt this no, year. No, but the, the, <laughs> the, the funny thing is she said, we have to raise the debt ceiling because it's important that we pay our bills in full on time. Well, if we paid our bills in full on time, we'd have no debt, right? <laughs> the reason we have a debt is because we don't pay our bills at all. We borrow money so that we don't have to pay our bills. And what Janet Yellen really means is that we need to raise the debt ceiling because we can't pay our bills. We can't pay we our bills, so we have to take more on more we debt. We have to, to take on back. more debt. Can, right? I, it's, can I ask a serious question? And yeah. I, I'm scared to ask you this because I'm going to give you like all the ammunition in the world. If I am taking money from one investor or lender to pay back the original yes. lender. Ponzi scheme. Well, there's two ways to look at it. It's called refinancing. People do it in mortgages all the time, right? It's also called a Ponzi scheme if they're investors that I'm not necessarily refinancing. Yes. I'm literally just playing like a Yes, a it is a How Ponzi you- scheme. That's why Bernie Madoff said that the United States was running the world's biggest Ponzi scheme and that what he did was nothing compared to that. And I, I used Wait, to that joke was really about his it. defense? Because, yep, no, but he just mentioned it. Like, hey, come on. I mean, like, he wasn't saying. <laughs> he said they do it. You guys are running the same thing. But, but this was the thing. <laughs> Did because, he really say that was really his yes, defense? Yes, yes. And then the, the New York Times wrote this piece and they mentioned it and they said, well, you know, Bernie Madoff doesn't have any credibility, right? So, and I used to joke and say, wait a minute, wait a minute. He's got credibility on one thing. Yeah, he knows Ponzi about Ponzi scheme. He knows what he sees. He knows all about Ponzi scheme. Yeah. Right. So if he says he's you're writing a Ponzi, Ponzi scheme. Yeah. Yes, exactly. That's why I used to joke we should have made him Secretary of the Treasury. Because he understood <laughs> the whole nature of what we were doing. You know, That's pretty and, good. Yeah. And, you know, because, but the thing is, the government, Janet Yellen, when she tells everybody that if we don't raise the debt ceiling, we're going to default, that's an admission it's a Ponzi scheme. Right. Bernie Madoff would never be dumb enough to admit he was running a Ponzi scheme. Right? That's Ponzi 101. You keep it quiet. <laughs> right? You don't tell everybody it's a Ponzi scheme because they're not going to OK. All right. All right. So that's the True. debt. Let's go to Social Security, because one of the things that I'm very interested oh, yeah, in. But before you do that, okay, I wanted right. to I forgot to finish answering the question as to why the inflation is going to be worse on a CPI. Look at um, producer prices. OK. Producer prices 2021 up more than consumer prices. So businesses were seeing their prices, costs rise more than what they passed on to their customers. Now, why was that? It's because a lot of businesses were reluctant to raise prices. They're worried about losing uh, sales to competitors. And they were told that it's all transitory. Okay, we'll take a hit for a few months. It's transitory. We don't want to reprice everything and then have to change the prices. So businesses kind of absorbed the rising prices and and took a hit in their margins. Uh, But I think by 2021 or 2022, rather, a lot of these businesses are going to throw in the towel and they're going to say, you know what? We got to pass this on. Uh, It's not temporary. And I think you're going to see businesses much more willing to raise prices in 2022 than they were in 2021. And is this where you see corporate executives on their uh, earnings calls being like, oh, we raised prices and like the customers liked it? Like it was basically they, <laughs> like that's basically what people have said. They've been like, oh, we raised prices and the market accepted it. Right. Yeah, they're not say, saying they, they liked it. They're just saying they accepted they our higher it. prices. They tolerated it. 
Um, and therefore now they feel emboldened to do more of it because they've seen like, hey, we did a little bit. We raised three or four percent. Nobody left. Actually, in some cases, demand's even higher. And so if we raise it five or six percent from here, then if nobody leaves, we can just continue to play well, this game. Yeah, I mean, they're going to raise prices as much as they can. I mean, in general, businesses want to maximize profits. And so the reason you don't keep raising prices is eventually you lose sales. Uh, but if all of your competitors are facing the same cost problems that you have, uh, when you raise prices, other people have to raise prices too. What ultimately happens though, as you really start to raise prices significantly, it does impact demand because not everybody can afford the higher prices. And then what happens is businesses end up reducing capacity so they can achieve their profitability at a lower scale. And then prices really start to go up because now supply is coming down because fewer businesses are providing these products or services uh, and, and you really get the spiral. But what's driving it all is the money. It's more money being created. I mean, they keep talking about the supply side problems. And I was, you know, just getting a tick out of Powell's testimony because- Did you they, watch, was that your Super Bowl? Were you, were you sitting there and you, you had a beer and like a, some steak and nah, a pizza? Well, I'm not, I, I didn't have refreshments or anything, but I was watching. <laughs> but, um, but Powell was like, well, because someone had said to him, well, what did you get wrong? You know, now that he's saying it's not transitory. And Powell said, well, you know, we got one thing wrong, and that was this supply problem, the supply. I mean, and he said, but, you know, in fairness, nobody could have predicted this. This was crazy. It came out of left field. I mean, nobody could have realized that the effect of the pandemic would have been like supply chain bottlenecks. And I'm like, what is this guy serious? I mean, so you basically shut down the entire economy, right? All these factories close. You furlough all the workers. You literally stop making stuff. And now you're surprised that there's a shortage of stuff. You're not making it anymore. How could there not be a supply chain problem? I pointed it out on my podcast in March of 2020. As soon as this happened, I said, I don't know why people are talking about COVID as being deflationary. This is inflation on steroids because not only are we flooding the world with money, we're stopping the production of goods. I mean, we, we're having less stuff and more money to buy it. This is like, you know, double inflation. Uh, so this shrinkflation and inflation. Well, we, you, you know, inflation is more money and chasing less stuff. Well, when when factories shut down, they're not producing stuff. How you does know, how do new variants play into this? Are they going to keep this game going? Are they going to keep doing it? Well, I mean, I mean, they're looking for excuses to con continue these programs. But the point what I want to finish. Shift let me finish making up. the point that <laughs> when we shut the economy down, right, and people stop working. They needed to stop spending. That was the right thing to do. Hey, you're no longer working. You're not producing goods and services. So you got to stop consuming because you're not producing. Correct. So we, but the idiots in Washington said, hey, we want to make sure that these unemployed people keep spending. On what? We're not making anything. But they gave them all this money anyway so that they could spend even though they weren't productive. So productivity and, fell, but they still had cash because they got handed free money yes, from the government. They, and they, they went they, and just spent A lot of that all. cash went into assets, though, not consumer yes, goods. Yes, well, it went both places. Yeah, because some, I mean, in fact, some of the people that got stimulus money went right to the Robin Hood and bought stocks. Some people went and bought crypto with it. Uh, but look at the, the the trade deficits. They they skyrocketed at all time record highs. We started buying all these goods that people were still making in other countries where they were still going to work. Um, but all of these things were very predictable, and it was a misguided policy. The Fed did the opposite of what it should have done. We should have contracted monetary supply, policy supply along with the contraction of the economy. But we didn't want to do that. We didn't have the stomach for that. And of course. We, the, the politicians could not have ordered people to go home if they didn't also say, well, by the way, we'll give you the same money that you would have earned. If the politicians said, hey, you gotta, you can't go to work. Oh, and by the way, you don't have any income. People would have said, screw that, I'm going to work. Mm -hmm. So but, did they, ha know, they had to do it, but it's bad because of it, the impact. It was horrible economic policy. And the obvious consequence is this massive you know, increase in prices that we're seeing, the supply shortages. But Powell acted as if nobody could have predicted this when it was the most obvious thing that only an idiot could have missed it. And, and the question is, if the Fed is so you know, incompetent that they don't see that when you stop production that you don't have supply, if they can't see that, what else are they missing? You know, What are the other obvious 
massive problems looming that the Fed is clueless about. All right. So when shift variant or some other <laughs> variant shows up, are they going to shut down the economy or is that now too politically sensitive? And so they're going to basically do everything they can not to shut it down and they're going to use stimulus to try to keep everything going. Or like, how do you look at the, well, like the future? I don't know if they're going to try to shut everything down again. I do know that there are a lot of, you know, factions that, that like to shut down. I mean, I'm surprised the teachers union hasn't come out and said, oh, oh, oh Omicron, we can't go to school. We got to se se send my paychecks. Uh, you know, I'm doing homeschooling again or whatever, uh, um, where they did it on online. But a lot of people don't like working. In fact, most people don't like working. They, they like getting paid. So if they can get paid without working, well, that's what they choose to do. And they yeah. can use uh, coronavirus as the excuse.